This is a headline from AL.com. Racial slur spray painted on Alabama interracial couples for sale sign. An interracial Jefferson County couple was shocked to find one of their realty company signs defaced Wednesday morning with a racial slur. Jeremy and Gina Miller were alerted about the slur on one of Jeremy Miller's signs outside a home on Bessie Lane in the Trustful area. The for sale sign was spray painted with the words, no, the N word, in large white letters. Jeremy Miller is white. His wife of 13 years is black. So a couple of things here. First of all, I think that any decent person hears about this and your heart goes right out to them. I mean, especially somebody that is in business like this, an advertisement for their business that just because the guy doesn't like that your husband happens to be white, that you write a racial slur targeting the man's wife, that's absurd and nobody should have to deal with that. Nobody should have to deal with some moron doing something like this, but you, this was actually true of the entire community, the entire, based on some of the stuff, and I won't read everything in the article, but the community, when they saw this rallied around them, they did everything that they could to send sort of condolences and, and tell them that they support them. And so it was really great to, if nothing else, and it's like so many other things, like a, a big storm or a hurricane or some kind of natural disaster or some kind of tragedy happening in a community. You hate for the tragedy to happen, but it's really encouraging to see the community rally around them. And so I guess that's kind of the silver lining approach to this. But it kind of reminded me of a story that happened when I was real little, maybe seven, six, seven, something like that, that... You have, of course, idiotic racist people all over the country and all over the world that see an interracial couple and are greatly offended by this and think that everybody else should be too and do stupid things like this. But the truth is, it's really more or less petered out. And this story kind of gives an example of this, and this is by no means to brag on myself because I was like six or seven at the time. I was not exactly well informed on the issues, as one would say, but it's indicative of the way that younger people think. And remember, I'm 30 years old now. Uh, I don't remember if what the event was or why we were doing this, but Mom was taking me over to meet somebody. I think that it was a friend of hers. And when we're getting out of the car to go into their apartment, uh, she said, Caleb, just so you know, um, the couple that we're about to go visit with, they're a mixed couple. I said, what do you mean a mixed couple? And she says, well, he's white and you've met him, but his wife is black. And my mom did this out of genuine concern, both for herself and me, because as hard as this may be to believe, I was a very opinionated child. And <laughs> pretty outspoken. And so her rationale behind this was, and she actually told me this later, her rationale behind this was not that she thought that I was going to say something racist or that I was going to be offended by this, but you don't see it very often. She thought it might catch me off guard. And she was worried that I was going to, to say something because I said something about virtually everything back then. Not much different than the way I am now. And she was afraid that I was going to say something that would embarrass me, and she was just more afraid that it would catch me off guard than I was going to say something racist or something. And my response to that was, I was confused. I said, why, why would I care about that? Like, it really did not make sense to me. As a child, a pretty young child, and this was the first time to my recollection that I had ever met a mixed-race couple, it made no sense to me why that would throw me off. Like, the thing that befuddled me was not the mixed-race couple. The thing that befuddled me is that my mom thought that I would have an issue with it or that I would be startled by it. And the reason is not because my mom's a bad person, and the reason isn't because my mom assumed that I was a bad person. The reason is my mom is older than me and grew up in a time where people were startled by that. 
and where it was a big deal. And I didn't, because I'm 20 years younger than her. And so I think that it actually is a testament to how far we've come and how much better things are now for people in this situation that the average person that grew up in my generation, I'm not saying there's none. I'm sure there's some that have a real problem with it. But the average person that grew up in my generation, we don't even think about that. It, it doesn't even cross our mind as that being a problem. There's exceptions, sure, but that's true for the vast, vast majority of people around my age. And we just didn't grow up around a culture that stigmatized that, and, and that's a good thing. That's something that ought to be celebrated. But one thing that I wanted to bring up as well, because I know, and I've already seen some people doing it in the comment section and in other places, there are some people that will see this story, and their immediate reaction is, ah, well, you know, it's Alabama, it's Birmingham, this is to be expected. But here's the thing. One inbred moron with a can of paint is not indicative of a whole city or an entire state. And sure, there's racist in Alabama, and sure, we have a history with that. There's a reason we're called the cradle of the civil rights movement. It's something to be proud of, but it's also the reason that it happened here is because of how bad the racism was. I mean, of course, nobody with a, a, a basic working knowledge of our state's history denies that. I mean, you can look at pictures of having dogs and fire hoses turned on people in the city of Birmingham. That's a reality. But we had, uh, in New York, upstate New York, Klan members recruiting children with candy. That was a story that I covered a few months ago. So things have really changed, and it's gotten a lot better. Not saying it's perfect. Not saying that it's not something we can't work on or approve on, because obviously, you know, sometimes stuff like this happens. And I'm glad that we can have that conversation when stuff like this happens. But I'm just saying, I it seems like this couple isn't taking this attitude, isn't taking the attitude of, well, you know, that's just something you have to deal with living in the South, living in Birmingham. I'm just afraid that the media will. And you may remember that when the, even though this is m much more serious than what happened here, I mean, as horrible as this was, nobody got hurt or died. You remember that shooting at the Emanuel Church, the one where the white supremacists went in and shot nine black people just because they were black. This absolute piece of human debris went in and killed people just because of the color of their skin. Do you remember how the families reacted it was one of the most heroic things that I have ever seen. One of the very, very few examples, in my opinion, of true Christ-like mercy. Where they came out and said, we forgive him, and if given the option, we would wrap our arms around him and tell him that God can forgive him. I mean, you guys know, I run a daily radio show, I'm a minister, I'm about to go back to get my master's in biblical studies. I hope one day I attain that level of grace, that I am that gracious towards other people. I don't know that I'll ever get to that point. But the point in all of that is, that story united people and rallied people around them. And within about three or four days, the media had completely twisted that to where we were at each other's throats over that issue, primarily over issues of race. Now, I, it doesn't seem as though this story is going to get a lot of national attention. So far, it hasn't. And the way that this family has reacted just based on the story that I've seen here at AL.com, it seems like the family is taking a very similar stance and, and trying to take the Christian path, the high road, in it, when it comes to their reaction to this idiot defacing their property. I'm just saying, don't let the media divide us again like they did on that story. Don't let them do exactly what the media did back then, because you'll remember that that was a couple days before they brought up the rebel flag thing over the state capital of South Carolina. That was their big thing, and that's what we wound up in a fight about, when the initial story didn't cause division. We weren't at each other's throats because of the way the family reacted. 
and the media still found a way to divide us. They still found a way to drive us apart from one another. They just had to come at the story from a different angle. All I'm saying is don't let them do that here. But I will read a little bit more of the story. The Millers live in the Hoover area and have been married since 2006. They have five children with a sixth on the way, all of whom are homeschooled. The couple describe themselves as deeper, deeply religious, owns local realty, and have dozens of listings throughout the county. Jeremy Miller said they've never experienced such racial hate. Quote, it hurts. I mean, we hear stuff, but I just brush it off, he said. I've never seen anything like this. This has never happened. He said uh, he, he said he was made aware of the deface sign by his wife. She was crying, he said. I will laugh in the face of adversity, but when it comes to protecting my wife and children, that's different. I gotta say, I admire this guy. And I admire him specifically because of the way that he worded this particular statement that there at the end. It says, happens to me, I don't care, I'll brush it off. Doesn't bother me. But what he's saying here in that last statement, he's like, hey, I laugh in the face of adversity. But this made me worried for my wife and my kids. And the fact that it hurt my wife, that's what changed things. See, this is not a guy that seems to me, based on this story, is some kind of rabid social justice warrior or is trying to draw attention to himself. He's saying, yeah, this ticked me off because it hurt my wife's feelings. Didn't bother me personally, but my wife's feelings are more important. I mean, this guy is absolutely doing his job as a husband and, and definite props for that. But this kind of brings me back to the point that I just made. And I, I just want to sort of flesh it out a little bit. Based on this and based on the, the way that all of this is happening, is this not a wonderful thing that we've come this far that this is a news story? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that what happened is a wonderful thing. I know that there's going to be someone that tries to take that out of context. But is it not a wonderful thing that this is a news story? Follow me on this. There was a time where in this country, people could round up, you know, two, three, four, a family of black people and string them up in the woods or burn crosses in their yard. And the media was afraid to cover it. That was a reality specifically in the Deep South. Now here we are in 2019, and we've got one guy, one racist inbred moron that painted a sign with the graffiti using a racial slur, and it becomes a big news story. That is, I think that says a lot about how far we've come. I really do. Because even that is so far beyond the pale that it makes the news rounds at least for at least statewide, maybe makes them a little bit at the national level too. We'll, we'll have to see. But I think it really says how far we've come and how much we've moved. And goodness knows that racial relations are not done and, and there's no room for improvement or any, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, look, it is a very good thing that we have come so far that everybody can unite virtually around this when, you know, 60, 70 years ago, people could get away with literally killing black people and the media wouldn't touch it. I think that does say a great deal for how far we've come on that particular thing. And what's interesting about this is this kind of hatred is actually the reason we have marriage licenses in this country. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people, when they start arguing about the, the gay marriage issue or any other kind of marriage issues, what many people on both sides, even my Christian brothers and sisters, tend to completely ignore is the reason we have marriage licenses in the first place is because of stupid people that wanted to control interracial marriage. That's really what it was about. That their goal was to make sure white people and black people couldn't marry. And that's the reason that marriage licenses were instituted in this country. Before then, the only person that it mattered to was you, your spouse, your church. 
they would have marriage licenses in churches sometimes, or some kind of certificate to say that you were married at that church. But as far as an actual legal document, a marriage license, didn't have it. George Washington was never legally married to Martha Washington. Abraham Lincoln was never legally married to Mary Todd. Doesn't mean they weren't married. They just didn't have a marriage certificate. The reason we had licenses in the first place is because there were people that were trying to keep interracial marriage from happening. And that's one of the main reasons, not the only reason, but that's one of the main reasons that I say, it's got poisonous roots anyway. Get rid of the whole institution. Let's just leave marriage in the hands of the church. And so if you understand that history, it really does change your perspective on it. So we'll finish up. This is the last little part, but I think that this is prevalent. And that's the reason that we're going to go over it. His wife agreed. She said, uh, she said she was raised in Birmingham and has never before been targeted because of her race. You get looks sometimes, but this is bold, she said. This is something that I'm not used to experiencing. There are people, and I don't necessarily think that they're evil people, because you look at the rash of race hoaxes that we've had, not just Jesse Smollett, but a lot of the other minor ones like the poop swastika and all these other things that have happened. It is not beyond the thought process of a reasonable person to look at a story like this and think, mm, is this a hoax? Because of this statement, I don't think that it is. Because typically, it doesn't fit the MO of somebody that's doing this, because if you're looking at most of the race hoaxes, those were people that were specifically looking for uh, the media to cover it. They were specifically looking for some kind of big hoopla. They were going in front of cameras as often as possible. They were pushing this sort of, sort of social justice warrior narrative. If that was what they were doing, you don't say, I've lived in Alabama my whole life, and I've lived in Birmingham my whole life, and something like this has never happened. This is the first time. You don't say that if you're trying to push this narrative that there is some kind of pervasive racial animus in our culture. I mean, is there are there racists in our culture? Absolutely. But they're a very small minority. And for the Jesse Smollett's of the world, they're trying to push this narrative that basically half the country is racist. Well, if you were trying to push that narrative, you would never say something like this. You would never say that this is a woman who, if she got married at 18 and she's been married to her husband for uh, 13 years, then that would make her 31. Now, I don't know if she was married at 18. She may even be older than 31, but what I'm saying is she was at least 31. And she's saying, I've lived here for 30 years. Again, somebody in my generation, and I've never had something like this happen, that there's been episodes where I kind of sent some racism from people, but this is actual bold. This is a big thing. This is where somebody was actually going out of their way to try to hurt my feelings. She's saying, never experienced anything like that before. Again, I think that's a testament to how far our culture has come, and that's a great thing. But based on this, I don't think that this one was a hoax. Maybe it turns out that it was, but I don't think that it was based on that. And you look at the MO of people that try to, to push that narrative, they just don't behave like that. I mean, those people specifically seek out finding incidents of deep-seated racism and everything. You remember Michelle Obama's <laughs> stupid story about this lady asking her to reach something on the top shelf at Target, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, first of all, I don't know how many times in different places I've been asked to do that, but it may have a lot more to do with the fact that you're like nine feet tall, <laughs> the fact that you have black skin. But you know, that, that's what I'm saying. Most of those people specifically stretch to make examples of racism out of examples of nothing at all. This is somebody that's actually had this happen to him, and she's saying, hey, this is the only time it's ever happened. So um, I'm not saying that the skepticism in our current climate is unfounded. I'm saying with this particular story, I don't think it's true, and I think that we ought to maintain exactly the same mentality that we do in cases of rape or sexual harassment, which is your default is always to listen to the victim, take it seriously. I'm not saying automatically believe. I'm saying listen to the victim, take it seriously, and you don't make a judgment call on that until you have more information. 
And as a general rule, that's a good policy to have with just about anything. But, you know, I will have this family in my prayers. I hope that you will too, because it seems as like it seems as though this really happened to them, that it was a real issue. But I really love the fact that they aren't letting it get to them, that it sounds like they were bothered by it, but they seem to be, uh, it's, the article says that they're deeply religious. They have, you know, a bunch of kids. They have homeschooling. They don't exactly fit that MO. And it seems as though this is somebody that lived in Birmingham their whole life and tends to live in Birmingham for a lot longer. I appreciate their attitude about it, and I do think it's admirable. <laughs> Oh, hey, what are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.